Today's episode is brought to you by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. It can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more podcast platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started right now. I'm Andrew and welcome to Unforbidden Truth. Today I'll be speaking with Washington mass murderer David Rice. David Rice is convicted of murdering the Goldmark family in Seattle, Washington. The family consists of Charles Goldmark, a civil litigation attorney, his wife Anne, his two children Derek, age 12, and Colin, age 10. The night of the murders, Charles Goldmark and his son Derek actually survived. Charles Goldmark died in the hospital on January 9th, 1986. And Derek died in a coma on January 30th, 1986. At the time of the murders of the Goldmark family, there was a group in Seattle. It was actually labeled a right-wing extremist organization that was anti-Jewish, anti-communist, and anti-Indian. David Rice believed at the time the family he was stalking to be Jewish and communist, which turned out to be false. The person David Rice was looking for, unbeknownst to him, had died years prior. David Rice disputes the motive of the murders, contradicting what he stated in court, which were motivated by greed and robbery, to be specific. On Christmas Eve of 1985, David Rice made his way to the Goldmark residence, and once he made his way inside the Goldmark's residence, he subdued the family with handcuffs and he chloroformed them one by one until they were unconscious. Once all the victims were laying on the floor, David began his brutal attack. He stabbed the victims and he beat them with an iron. Blood was splattered on every single wall where the victims' bodies were found, which had indicated that the victims had been struck while they were lying on the ground. On December 26th, two days after the murders occurred, the police got a call from a man named Robert Brown. He had believed the man that was staying over at his apartment was involved in the murders of the Goldmark family. He opened a notebook of David Rice's that he had left in the apartment. And when he opened the notebook, it said, To whom it may concern, I am the person you are looking for in the Goldmark case. Robert Brown called the police after he read that notebook, after he was startled and afraid that the man staying with him had just murdered this family. After Robert Brown spoke to the police, he did confirm the identity of his house guest as being David Rice. Robert Brown was waiting for detectives to arrive to the apartment when the police had saw a man that was matching David Rice's description take off down the apartment steps, and he ran off as police narrowed in on him. As David Rice was running, he stopped and took a vial out of his pocket, and there was some liquid inside, which he then took a drink of, and after police recovered the vial and did tests on it, it turned out to be liquid nicotine. Once police apprehended the suspect, he did identify himself as David Rice. Once David Rice was taken into custody, the police asked him about the journal that he had started the statement. After he was arrested, David Rice did admit that he did indeed write the note. This is what the confession note said. To whom it may concern, I'm the person you're looking for in the Goldmark case. I know that what I did was a very terrible thing. That is why I am as you see me now. I want it perfectly understood that no one else had anything whatsoever to do with what I did. I went to great lengths to make sure of that. The person that I live with doesn't even know that I'm wanted on a different charge. She received a couple of messages on her machine, but I erased them before she got to them. I did not use the rifle that I purchased a few weeks ago. Instead, I fooled them with a toy pistol, which you will find in a storage locker. I threw the rifle, pistol was originally written and scratched out, away a couple weeks ago. Again, I want it understood that no one knew anything about this, so please do not cause any unnecessary suffering to innocent people. I think that I've already done enough. I guess I should tell you why I did what I did. That way, you won't have to ask other people about it. My life is a mess. It has been since my wife left. Anna's been trying to help me straighten it out, but I'm afraid she isn't able to do much for me. I am much too far gone. When I left high school, I could go out, I could get a job in any town at any time. I needed one. When I got married, jobs were starting to get scarce. I had to do more walking and searching to find work. I found myself more and more on the unemployment line, which was getting longer and longer. I went to the government offices to see what I could do to alleviate my employment situation, and they recommended I go to school and learn engineering. 
During David Rice's confession to police, he had detailed the extent of his preparations, and he had said that he had been planning to kill Charles Goldmark and Ann Goldmark for six months. David Rice had said that was his intent on the day of the murders. David Rice hadn't planned on killing any children, and he didn't expect any kids to be there, and he claims he would have never went there had he known there would have been children present. On December 26, police searched Ann Davis's apartment and storage unit. Police found many items of incriminating evidence to corroborate his statements. They found, among other items, the toy gun which he used to get inside the home, a bottle of chloroform, and the clothing he wore during the murders, including the pair of cloth gloves that he was wearing at the time. On December 26, 1985, David Rice was arrested and charged with four counts of aggravated murder. David Rice was sentenced to death in 1986 for the killings of the Goldmark family. David Rice had displayed signs of psychotic symptoms throughout his trial, but his attorney had failed to emphasize that. David Rice's death sentence was later overturned and it was on grounds of an incompetent defense. In 1998, David Rice pled guilty to the murders of the Goldmark family and he avoided getting the death penalty for a second time. David Rice is serving a life sentence in Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. Here's my interview with David Rice. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. This call is from... David? An inmate at Washington State Penitentiary. Hey, how are you doing? Good about yourself. Not bad, not bad. Tell me about your childhood and what it was like growing up. Well, it was uh, fairly typical for uh, the first few years. I was the only uh, I was the only child that my father had with my mother. Uh, my brothers were all from a different father, and my sister was adopted. Uh, I was sort of the oddball. Uh, the other boys considered me their stepdad son rather than uh, rather than a brother. So. I was sort of always left out in the cold, but uh, there were times when uh, we got together, we were able to do things, but it was generally them on their own. As for me, I sort of, well, I went into the books. I loved to read. At age nine, I started reading the Encyclopedia Americana, and I finished that at age 12. One of my earliest recollections is when I was about four, four and a half years old, my, my uh, mother had gone to the school, I believe, to pick up my brother, and uh, she left me uh, playing in the, in the front yard. She said, don't go anywhere. I said, I won't. Then, of course, the moment she left, I went next door. So, I was in uh, rapping with the uh, with the neighbor kid there, and I got into the back door, and and the back door there, his sisters had been washing the back door, and I didn't really take any notice of it. Later on, uh, I saw my mother driving up the street. I said, "Oh crap!" and started to uh, haul my butt out the uh, out the back door. And I didn't realize it, but they shut it. And it was freshly washed, so I didn't even see it until I was almost uh, on it. And I went through this double thick hurricane door, head first. As I was looking back, I saw this great big, huge shard hanging in midair. And I thought, wow, that would have been a good thing that didn't come down. But uh, I went out to. Uh, the street out to the sidewalk and was walking up towards the house and my brother got out of the car and he said, David, you're bleeding. And uh, wiped my, my head with my hand and, and it was covered in blood. Oh yeah, I started crying then. Were you taken to the hospital after that and was that a lifelong injury? Uh, yeah. One of the shards went through the top of my skull, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what it did, but uh, I have uh, degenerative nerve disease in my right eye. So you're partially blind in one eye then? Yes, almost, almost entirely. So did you ever suffer any type of abuse growing up as a child? Uh, no, not really. The old man, he could, he could get a little, uh, a little upset at times. 
Uh, he was a very patient man, uh, extraordinarily patient. And uh, he actually saved it up. And uh, when his patience ran out, then yeah, he could get he could get pretty high. Uh, he came really close to beating my older brother to death one time, and uh, that's when he and my mother separated for a while, for several years. And uh, so from age what, seven till I was thirteen, uh, he was gone. He was gone. He came home for uh, for Christmas and and Fourth uh, of July, but otherwise he was gone. Besides the incident with the glass busting on your head, can you think of any other traumatic events that you may have gone through as a child? Uh, I was a very uh, accident-prone kid. I pretty much wouldn't refuse any hair, ever. So, yeah, I've fallen out of a lot of trees and and, uh, got stuck in a lot of weird places. From what I understand, there was an incident of self-harming when you were a young child. Uh, that was when I was about, uh, about 10 years old. I was at my next door neighbor's house. And uh, mom was calling over for to call me to dinner. And the intent was to go home and, and go to dinner. But one thing led to another and I, I didn't go. And she called again, and the same thing happened, and again and again. Finally, my older brother came over and uh, got me. And on the way in the door at the house, uh, he gave me a good swift kick. And my oldest brother, he didn't care for that. And uh, they got into an argument. And I was a little upset already, and... I didn't like the way they were they were talking to one another, and so I closed the door. I went into my room, closed the door. And then I heard them uh, talking about cutting, and I opened the door, and they both had knives in their hands. And that really that really stuck with me. I uh, I didn't want to be the cause of my brothers essentially killing one another over something stupid that I did. And I decided that was never going to happen again. So I pulled the drawer open to to essentially lock my door. And uh, I hung myself. Next thing I knew, my brother was sitting on top of me, my oldest brother, and uh, uh, doing heart massage. And what happened was they had to break down my door after my mom had gotten worried that there wasn't enough noise coming out of my room. And she saw me hanging there. So she screamed. They broke down the door. And uh, luckily they had, they had just learned uh, CPR that year and uh, were able to resuscitate uh, I was dead for about five minutes. And uh, actually, that was an interesting experience. Uh, it was actually a wonderful experience. Uh, that was the most peaceful moment I've ever experienced in my life. I could see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. But there wasn't anything there to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. It was just a black blackness no light at all after the suicide slash attempted suicide incident were you ever hospitalized or institutionalized as a child did you ever get any psych evals or anything like that after that incident uh yeah there was uh psych evaluation uh but uh, it turned out the uh the psychologist tried to uh uh me essentially and that turned me off on it. So was that the only, is that the only psych eval you had after that? Did your parents just never follow up? No. So let's talk about your behavior, what your behavior was like in your school years, elementary, middle school, high school. What was your behavior like? Uh, I 
up until that point, it was pretty normal. Uh, I got average, average grade. Yeah, pretty much average kid. Uh, although, I, like I said, I was a daredevil. I took a lot of dares. And so, you know, every once in a while, I'd find myself in the, uh, in the uh, nurse's office. After that, things got uh, pretty crazy for me. I'd made a decision that I would never close my fist on my brother again. Let's fast forward a little bit and let's talk about a group in Seattle. It was actually a right wing extremist magazine and group called the Duck Club, which you were a supporter and I guess member of. Uh, the Duck Club, it was just a bunch of people getting together and saying, hey, look, things aren't going right here. Uh, the motto of the Duck Club was, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it must be a duck. They had a habit of, of Calling, calling politicians out if they, if they didn't uh, uh, do what they said they were going to do. Essentially, I was just there because I was giving somebody else a lift and uh, didn't really have much to do that day. So at the time, you were a follower of the Duck Club. On December 24th, 1985, the murder of the Goldmark family happened. Can you walk us through the confluence of events that led up to the subsequent murders of a husband, wife, and two children? The murders were not planned. I did check out the, uh, the neighborhood. Uh, I've been told that uh, uh, Mr. Goldmark was a big monkey muck in, in the uh, American uh Communist Party. Uh, of course, that turned out to be false. But what I'd gone there for was to question him. I was actually after one of the sabotage, uh, saboteur groups uh, that are always located around our uh, strategic bases. And those groups are still there to some extent. Uh, and of course, we have groups in Russia as well. But uh, my intent was to take out one of those groups in hopes of uh, slowing things down. So you were canvassing the area a little bit beforehand, and you thought that you had the right person, right. but it turns out you didn't have the right person after all, right? That's right. So who were you originally looking for, and who did you end up finding? Uh, apparently, uh, it was his father. It was his father that they were talking about. And... Uh, Things had come to big hit back then. Uh, just got done burying my mother. I was in the midst of uh, a separation and, and probable divorce. Things weren't going the way they were supposed to in any way, form, or fashion. And so I was under a great deal of stress, enormous amount of stress. And uh, when that door opened, that turned out to be a failure as well. Something just clicked. From that moment on, I was on autopilot. It turned out that there were uh, two kids there. That was enough of a shock that everything I had planned just disappeared. It evaporated. And I started walking through the door. As I'm walking, I'm saying, whoa, wait, let's get out of here. I had a, a toy pistol that uh, I modified to look real, and uh, and I, I had that in a box that had a, a, a shipping shipping label on it. It could look like uh, I was delivering. I was taxi driver, but uh, at first I'd gone to the wrong house. I went to the next door to neighbor's house, and. Uh, that was just one more, one more shock to the system. After you force your way into the house with the toy gun, what happens after that? How do you deal with the situation after that? I know you said you were thrown off guard when the kids were there. So what do you do with the mom and dad? What do you do with the kids? What happens next before this mass murder of this family? Well, this, uh, like I said, this was, this was a, a shock that was, that was final the final straw, uh, I snapped. And uh, things just happened that, that I couldn't even, couldn't even understand, much less control. Uh, 
I took the kids upstairs uh, where the folks were, and uh, I'd taken uh, a couple of pairs of handcuffs because I was ready for them to be there. I was going to question them, and uh, I had chloroform so that there wouldn't be any stupid crap. I had left. I, I even had a pocket knife. I left that at home. I didn't want any any stupidity, and uh, that wasn't enough. I had them handcuffed. I had them on the floor. They were, they were, everything was going fine. And uh, I don't know what happened. Somebody said, are you going to kill us? And that was enough of a suggestion. And I said, yeah. And uh, I grabbed an iron, steam iron. And once I had them chloroformed over, started using the steam iron on them. Uh, I hit them again and again, and I don't even know why. That's not what, that, what I went there for. I went there to talk. I went there to find out where the saboteurs were. I didn't go there to hurt anybody. Were they conscious, or were they still knocked out from the chloroform when you started essentially assaulting and yeah. killing them? Yeah, they were still unconscious. Uh, it was him first, uh, 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 Charles. And then her, and then the two kids. After after I beat him with the iron, uh, I I decided to go down and, and, and uh, grab a, a, a knife out of the kitchen, and I wanted to make sure that they didn't wake up as vegetables. Uh, it was kind of a weird thought, but. I didn't want them to, to, to be vegetables at all for, for any amount of time. So uh, I used, I used the, the kitchen knife to uh, make sure that they never woke up. Things just happened. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever watched a, a, like a horror movie and, and you know there's a bad guy in the room and somebody decides they want to go in that room and you say, oh man, don't go in there. You know what's in there, and yet they go in anyway. It's kind of like that. You being the bad guy in this instance. That guy and the guy saying, "Don't go in that room." It's so it's so weird that I, I'm not even sure how to how to describe it. So, what was the moment that you realized consciously that you had just murdered this family? Uh, that took a while. I'd already gotten back to the apartment by that time. It's like waking up from a dream. And it finally plugs in. Until then, I was like on autopilot. I was just going through the motion. When it did finally hit you that you were responsible for this, how did it make you feel? Oh, I wanted to kill myself right then. I had a, uh, I had a, a rifle, and I figured the best way to ensure... That would uh, that would happen. I should take a couple of pot shots at a at a cop car and let them shoot me because I knew if the cops say they have a tendency to uh, go a little overboard, uh, that way I'd be sure that it would be done correctly. These murders happened on Christmas Eve. Two days later, you are arrested for the four murders of the Goldmark family. What was going through your mind when you were finally in handcuffs, headed to the jail to be booked into custody? I was just sorry that uh, I wasn't able to get a hold of my rifle. I really, really wanted to kill myself. As a matter of fact, I had a, uh, a vial of uh, tobacco juice, concentrated tobacco juice, that uh, I had expected to uh, use as a little uh, added insurance. But... Uh, unfortunately, that didn't, that didn't work either. You were ultimately charged with four counts of aggravated murder and convicted and sentenced to death. When you were sentenced to death, how did that make you feel, knowing that you were going to be executed? I actually was relieved. I had actually asked the prosecutor to ensure that I got the death penalty. So I was relieved when I got it. Eventually your death sentence was overturned on grounds of an incompetent defense. And in 1998, you pled guilty to the four murders to avoid being sentenced to death again. 
Was there a sense of relief when the death penalty essentially was off the table and you got the life sentences? Not really, no. Because no matter what happens, I'll never be able to pay for these murders. Not fully. Ever. No matter what. How does it make you feel knowing that you will not be executed and you'll live the rest of your days out in prison, essentially dying from a slow death sentence that will result in possibly dying 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, depending on your health? It's not something to be relished, but I deserve it. I deserve it. I can't deny that. The only reason I took the deal was to avoid subjecting both my family and their family to that same horrible experience of the trial. Again, nobody wanted that, and I don't blame them at all. So to avoid that, I took the deal. But I still deserve to die. And then some, like I said, no matter what happened, I'll never pay for this. It was almost like a bittersweet feeling, whether you're executed or live your days out in prison. Right. Before we conclude this interview, is there anything you would like to say or get off your chest after all these years? I know it's been almost four decades since all of this had happened. Yes. You know what? Uh, in court, when I took the deal, I wanted very much to apologize to the family. And my attorneys argued against it. But to this day, uh, I still I still need to apologize for our family. So if any of them listen, I am sorry beyond words. That was my interview with Washington mass murderer David Rice. Go check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash unforbidden truth. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden truth.